All right, so uh, we're going to do, uh, uh, we, we've been in this series, uh, for those of you guys who have been kind of coming or, or tuned in over the last few months, we've been in this series uh, on couples of the Bible. And so we've gone through a whole bunch of different couples, uh, kind of looked at their, uh, some of them great examples of, of marriage and men and women, some of them not really great examples of men and women, and, uh, and so we've looked at that from either side and, and learned from those couples. And so we've gone through quite a few of these couples, actually. Uh, we started with Adam and Eve, you know, looked at how they're created uh, very differently, men and women. They're, they were created differently, but created perfect for each other, and how that's a representation, of course, of us today. Uh, we looked at Hosea and Gomer, uh, Interesting names, and uh, this was kind of this this love story of God and His people, and, and this uh, this great kind of unconditional love. No matter what, uh, no, no matter what happened, God was was still there. Uh, we talked about King Xerxes and Queen Esther, uh, God's plan prevailing through that story, and kind of the the bravery that Queen Esther showed as she followed uh, God's calling in her life. Uh, Aquila and Priscilla, this New Testament couple, they kind of like went around everywhere and uh, shared the gospel and taught people and opened up their homes for churches and all, did all these great things. Kind of this, this was one of the great examples of kind of how we should be um, in the modern church, I guess you could say. Uh, we looked at King Solomon and the Shulamite woman, this kind of love story and intimate connection that they had, you know, intimate uh, uh, time that they had. Uh, Joseph and Mary, uh, we talked about them trusting in God even when it didn't really make sense. Um, you know, <laughs> I, think, I think about that story a lot, you know, Joseph and Mary and how difficult that must have been for Joseph to really trust in the Lord. Like, you know, I'm pregnant. No, 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 trust me. It's not, you know, it's from the Lord, I promise. And, and uh, it was tough. So a lot of faith uh, in that uh, couple. So we learned about that. Uh, we talked about Ananias and Sapphira, this kind of hypocrisy in the church, saying one thing, doing another, and the, the consequences of that in their, in their uh, example. David and Bathsheba, um, an example of uh, no accountability and uh, you know, allowing yourself into temptation and, and the destruction that that had in his life and uh, that it, that what it caused and how to stay away from that in our marriages. That's a great example of what not to do. Um, and today we're going to kind of go into, I'm going to go ahead and say, the greatest couple of all time in the Bible, which is Christ and his church. Um, this will kind of uh, cap off this, uh, this series we've been going through. Uh, we may still do some, some further teachings with other couples uh, throughout the winter and spring here, but this will kind of finish it off for, for right now. And what, a, what better way to finish off this series than with Christ and his church, or sometimes Christ and his bride, you'll hear it referred to. It's talked about in different ways. But this cool example of, of marriage and, and how the earthly representation of, of our marriages, how God has created us, represents the relationship that Christ has with his church. And, and it's just, just really cool. So we're going to look at this, uh, and we're going to kind of look into this relationship and see what, uh, what it can teach us and what it has for us. Um, we're going to do things a little bit differently tonight. Uh, we're going we're gonna to dig into this couple, we're going to learn a little bit about this, and we're going to end with a little bit of time of prayer uh, for you to just kind of sit where you're at and uh, grab your husband or wife's hand and just kind of spend some time in prayer before the Lord. Uh, Justin and, and, and Brad are going to come up and uh, do a little bit of uh, uh, worship for us at the end, and uh, it'll just be kind of a nice time to just praise God and worship together. Uh, we're not going to be meeting in our small groups, we're going to actually just kind of hang out and fellowship after that. You can stay as long as you want to, and... Uh, I know I say that. Sometimes we're here till like 11, it seems like, but that's all good. It's all good. No. Um, as long as you want to, we'll be here uh, to just hang out and fellowship together. So. so Christ and his church. In order to understand this relationship, we need to understand who these people are, Christ and his church, right? Most of us know Christ, God's only son who came to earth in human form, fully man and fully God, sacrificing himself on the cross to pay the ultimate price for our sins, Jesus Christ. And his church is his bride in this, in this uh, example that we're given. We're going to look in Ephesians here. But who's the church? This is really gets confusing for, for a, a lot of people a lot of times. I know I was confused about it for many years. I thought that the church was that building that I went to every Sunday and the, you know, had my membership app and my card and whatever class I went through or learned about this denomination or that denomination. I thought that was a church. 
that's not really what a church is. So we're going to look at kind of an interesting take on this or example of this. We're going to look in Ephesians 4. Um, if you flip to Ephesians 4 and 5, we're going to be there quite a, quite a bit because this is really where most of this, uh, the meat of this, this relationship is. Um, Ephesians 4, uh, verse 15 and 16 says this, Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. So we have Christ as the head, from whom the whole body is joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. So here you have this other kind of idea of Christ as the head, and then we as believers in Jesus Christ are his, we become his body, and that we are, <clears throat> excuse me, equipped and joined together by the gifts, the things that we are equipped with, that he equips us with, and each part, so all of us have different parts, are working properly. That makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So we have this kind of example of Christ as the head of the church and his body as us, those who have come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I don't assume that anybody or that everybody ha- understands exactly what that means. That means that that moment when you understand the separation that you have, the sin that is in each one of us that separates us from a holy God, when we learn, when we understand that, when we understand that we are in need of a Savior to be right with the Lord, that Jesus Christ is that Savior, that He came and died on the cross as the ultimate sacrifice for those sins, and that by believing in Him, it says if we confess with our mouth and we believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord and that God raised Him from the dead, defeating death, He, ra- he was raised up to be with the Father. When we understand the power of that in our life, it says that God indwells us with the Holy Spirit and we become His adopted children. We become part of His kingdom, part of His body, part of His church, His bride somebody that is cherished by him, somebody that he loves and cares for. This is the body of Christ. This is the church. This is who we are. It doesn't matter where we are. It doesn't matter any of those things. What building we're in, it doesn't matter what house we're in, it doesn't matter what city street we're on. We are the church. We come together, we work together for the gospel, but we are the church. We are Christ's bride. So, what does, uh, so God gives us this earthly representation of marriage, right? Husband and a wife. The husband is the head, the wife is the, the, the bride or the, or the church. We're going to read through some of this in Ephesians 5. Um, if, if we want to understand, you know, Paul calls this a mystery. It's one of the, the mysteries that he reveals in the book of Ephesians. Um, it's a mystery, this representation that our marriage is. And we're going to read through this, these whole, the, the whole kind of uh, section here in Ephesians 5, and then we'll diagnose this. So we've, if any of you guys have been around the marriage ministry at all, or marriage uh, teachings at all, this, you're probably like, oh, Ephesians 5 again. Great. We read this a lot, and it's, there's a reason for that. Ephesians 5 is the home of this representation. It's just where it is described in its fullest and, and most complete. There are other areas where it's talked about, but this is the best way. So Ephesians 5, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. We're going to talk about this in a minute. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. His body, here's this example again, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. And then here we have the husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. No, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Here it is again. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. It's quoting Genesis here. And the two shall become one flesh. And here he says, Paul's writing to the church, he says, this mystery is profound. 
that I am saying that it refers to Christ and his church. This very relationship between husband and wife and how it, how it is set up and how, how we're called to act and be and, and, and our roles that we have as husband and wife, this, this whole thing, it, it represents, it refers to Christ and his bride, the church. There is no better representation out there. There's nothing else that God has created, nothing else that he has ever made or talked about that can represent this relationship better than our marriage. And that's, he's saying this is, this is crazy. Look, look, look at what this represents. Look what your marriage represents, this relationship between Christ and his church. It's crazy. It's this very picture. So let's, let's diagnose this and look into this. What does this mean for us, right? Number one, we see this intimate relationship that he wants for us. So if he's using marriage as the example of his relationship with us, this is a very intimate relationship. I don't know anyone in the world who knows me besides God who knows me better than my wife. She knows things about me that I'm sure she'd wish that she could unknow. <laughs> we know each other in a marriage. We, we know the, the things, the, you know, we, we, we know so much about each other. We're so close. And that's the way God's called us to be in a marriage, husbands and wives as one flesh. There's no, no secrets anymore. There's no me and you, it's us. This is a close and intimate relationship. This is what he's, he wants with us. God wants that same relationship that he's called us to in our marriage. He wants that relationship with him as well. How do I know that? Because he knows us more intimately than anybody does. And if we look back in, uh, the, in uh, Psalm 139, it gives a good, kind of paints this cool picture of how intimately God knows us and cares for us in Psalm 139, 13. It says this. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. God knew us. Every hair on our head was numbered. He knew the, the every day of our life before they even happened. He, he knits us together and forms us, and he knows our hearts. He knows what we're after in life. He knows our mistakes he knows, you know, when we turn to him, when we turn away from him, he knows, he knows it all. He knows us. He's got it. He wants this and knows that he has this intimate relationship with us. Nothing is hidden from him. Nothing is hidden from him. Sometimes we need to be reminded of that. But God's relationship, and this is the same kind of example that we give in our marriage. There should be no hidden places and secret things. We talk about this often with accountability and other things. There's this is a, a union, an intimate relationship where we get to know each other. Now, it doesn't always happen all at once. That happens over time in our marriage. We learn more and more about each other. I'm still learning about more and more things about my wife, and I'm sure she's learning things about me. And this is part of our marriage. It also, this relationship between God and his church, Christ and his church, Christ and his bride, however you would like to say it, gives us this great example of commitment God was committed to his church. He is committed to us as his children. He, is, he has made promises to us, and one thing we know about God is that he will keep those promises, and so should we. God is there with us. He is there for us. He has promised this. And many times back in the Old Testament, the Israelites went through all these different struggles and things, and God continually told them, repent, turn away from your sin, turn to me, I'm here for you. Back in Deuteronomy 31, uh, Deuteronomy 31.6, back in the, uh, one of the first few books of the Bible here, and, and this is repeated many times throughout the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 31, 6. I'm sorry, I don't have the verses on the screen today. It says this. The Israelites are in a war. They're, he's talking to Joshua here. They're, they're battling these the people here, and, and, he, and it's not important in this particular case, but what, what does God say in verse 6? 
31.6. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Why? Because he said he wouldn't. He said he would be there. He's going to be there. Don't be afraid. Whatever you're going through, whatever war is going on in your life, in your marriage, God is there with you. He has promised to be there for us. The Israelites weren't the perfect bride. Many times throughout the Old Testament, we, well, we did this minor prophet study uh, earlier last year, uh, what a mess they were. They were. God was always sending these prophets to tell them, hey guys, what are you doing over here, worshiping these other gods and doing all these crazy things I told you not to do? Come on back over here. He called them his adulterous people. They were cheating on him. He calls them many in many books of the Bible, Hosea being one example, you know, God's adulterous people. They turned away from him again. But guess what? Repent, it says, Joel in the book of Joel. Rend your hearts, repent of your sin, and turn back to me. The, the story of the prodigal son and many others come to mind. Where's God at? He's right there. Because he promised he would be there. He promised a savior through the line of David for God's people, the Israelites. He promised these things. He made commitments and covenants with them. Guess what? You've made some commitments too. When you stood before an altar somewhere or a, or a pastor somewhere or a guy with a card that said he was ordained and you got married, you said some vows to one another. You made a commitment to each other. Just like God made a commitment to his people, we make commitments to one another. We, we say vows and we say before to each other and before the Lord in sickness and in health. And there's no like, I mean, I don't, at least I don't, I don't know. I wasn't at all of your weddings, but I mean, I don't think anyone said like in sickness and in health, unless it's like really bad, because then like not like real bad sickness, but like if it's a little sickness, that's cool, you know, and th- you know, through, through hard times and good times, you know, well, if they're real hard though, like I can get out then, right? Like it's not like, how, how are we talking here? You know, there's no like, there's no out, there's no stipulation in the contract. There's no clause at the bottom that says, well, in case these things happen, you're cool. You can, you can jet. Marriage is a commitment. It's a commitment to each other. God commits to us, and he, sh- he sets the example as, as, as the relationship between him and his church. Why shouldn't we follow that example and commit to one another no matter what? No matter what. And, and let me kind of expand on that. That means that you're committed to your marriage no matter what your wife does, no matter what your husband does. doesn't say in there anywhere that we are in this commitment unless, well, she did this. Well, you don't know because she did these things. Like, certainly, no. He did this stuff. He did this. He did that. No. He said this. No. We're committed to one another. We made a commitment to each other. You know, too often do we toss that commitment, not, not saying anybody in particular, I'm just saying in general, people in, in our culture, in the world today, we just toss these commitments aside and we say, it doesn't mean anything. God's telling us, this means something. Your marriage represents Christ and his church. That's a commitment that I want you to model. We're responsible for our actions. We're accountable to God for what we do When we sin, we're accountable to God. We need to turn and repent to him. My wife doesn't have to repent for my sin. I do. I need to turn to God. I need to open up. God uses this example of marriage to show the commitment that he has made to us and underline the commitment he has called us to in our marriage. All right, back to Ephesians. Here's where I get nervous every time. Ephesians 5.22. So, Ephesians 5.22, this verse a lot of times is, uh, it's hard to to teach on this as a man because you don't want to come across as, you know, I'm a man, okay? (laughs) I don't want to come across as like a jerk or something, you know. Uh, These verses have been, misconstrued and, and, and misused and screwed up by so many people for so many years that now they've, they, they're, it's like so you're saying something really bad. But let me tell you, this is a beautiful picture that we're going to paint. It says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and himself is its Savior. It says, Wives, 
submits here, husband. So what an awful word. This act of submission that God has, is drawing this example of here in our marriage. It doesn't say wives submit to every husband. It doesn't say women submit to every man. That is not, it doesn't say anything like that in there. It says, in fact, wives submit to your own husbands. You, He's your possession. He's your husband. You're going to submit to him, but you're not really submitting to him because guess what? My wife should never submit to me. I don't deserve anything. I'm lucky that she still wants to look at me and love me half the time, let alone submit to me. I don't deserve that. She submits willfully in a way that is honoring to the Lord. She's submitting to Christ. She's submitting to what glimmer of Jesus that I can show in my life. That's what the submission is for. It's this, it's this honorable uh, submission to the Lord. It's hard to hear sometimes. We don't want to talk about this. This isn't the husbands to control and say, my wife is not submitting to me. It, that is not, husbands, that is not your job. And if, and if that's become your job, stop doing that. Not good. Right, it's not going to go well for you. You know what your job is as a husband? Be a husband that's worth submitting to. Now, that doesn't mean that your wife has to submit to that or anything like that, but you know what your job is? Focus on your relationship with the Lord and what you're supposed to do as a husband. Be a husband worth submitting to. And that, that doesn't mean you deserve anything. Well, I'm great, I do. Everything. No, that's not what it's about. This is, you focus on you and let her focus on her. Let her focus on her relationship with the Lord and how she sees fit to do that, given what the scripture has revealed to her. We all submit to Jesus. We are all his bride. We all submit to the Lord. That's what we do. And it's an honor to submit to, to Jesus. It's, not, it's an honor to submit to him. It, 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 you know, and this is what this kind of represents. Women might, you might think, man, I have a heart. I got I to do this. This is awful. This is hard. I can't do this. Well, guess what? We're going to read the next part. Husband's got it pretty hard too. All right. Verse 25. It says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Here's the catch. And he gave himself up for her. Man, you have to submit. We got to die for you. This is tough. <laughs> you know, end of submission. We're dead. That's it. <laughs> you, th this is, this is a, uh, I mean, this is a high calling, man. Let me tell you. You're called to, sub or to, to sacrifice yourself for your wife. Christ came to earth. He didn't do anything wrong. Dies on the cross, sacrificing himself for all of us. And in this picture of Christ and his church, guess what, husbands? That's the role that you've been called to fill. Doesn't mean go out and jump in front of a car and say, I'm the best husband in the world. That's not, that's not it. Okay, it means die to your selfishness, die to yourself, die to your, your wants and needs and goals and plans and all these things. You know what? Maybe instead of thinking in our world all the time, husbands, maybe we should start thinking in her world. What does she need? What is she doing? How can I support her wants and needs instead of thinking of ourselves? It goes on in here to talk about, uh, and I think this is kind of fitting for, for husbands maybe in a way, and my, maybe not everyone, but it's like... Uh, you, you wouldn't not take care of yourself, would you? It says you take care of, you nourish yourself, you eat, don't you? You don't miss a meal. You take care of all these, you take care of yourself and your appearance and how you look. Well, you should take care of your wife just as, as, just as much, put just as much energy and effort into, into taking care of yourself and, and, and as you take care of your wife. So I'm not a fighter, okay? I'm, I'm not, I know, I know I look like one, I get it. <laughs> I'm not a fighter. I, I'm a, I hate confrontation. I, I've, my whole entire life, every fight that I've ever been in is pretty much been me getting punched, end of fight. That's pretty much it. <laughs> I'm not a fighter. I would rather joke my way out of a, of a confrontation or something else. But I'll tell you what. When somebody wants to harm my wife, or wants to hurt her in some way, I will be the first person to jump in between whatever harm that is 
and her. I will be the first person to take that blow for her. I will be the first person to step in front of whatever hurt might be coming her way. I mean that. I, don't, I wouldn't do that for really anyone. Maybe, maybe kids, you know, maybe. I mean, I love you guys too. I would, you know. But there's something in me. There's something there that God's put there that I'm to, to protect her and I'm to watch over her and I'm to care for her. Christ does that for us. I think that's the example he sets. I'm not saying you should go out and start fights. I don't think Christ sets that example, but there was a time when uh, uh, Lisa will love that I'm telling the story. Uh, <clears throat> we were in, uh, my, my daughter, my oldest daughter was in middle school, and she was in basketball. She played a lot of basketball, like, uh, you know, tournaments all the time and all that stuff, travel leagues and everything else. So it's pretty competitive, you know, middle school basketball, pretty serious stuff, you know, middle school, seventh, eighth grade, you know, certainly some scholarships on the line and stuff like that. So, you know, the, the kids that get out there, you know, they're playing, they're having fun or whatever, but, but who's really playing the game sometimes is the parents, Right. The parents, they, they care more about, they're more involved. You see that call, ref? And they're yelling at everybody. I've kind of gotten caught into this sometimes too. You know, you get into the game and you see some wrongs out there and you just want to throw on the stripes and go out there and ref the game for them and they can't do it right. Well, this guy who was a, a dad of one of the girls playing on the other team, big dude, wearing an ultimate fighting championship shirt, you know, <laughs> Tattoos up to his neck, just, you know, big dude. He's out there. He starts getting into the game. He starts yelling at the refs. I mean, he won't stop, you know. He keeps yelling at the refs. He's yelling at the girls. He's yelling at his daughter. He's saying all these things. Well, I'm kind of like, yeah, yeah, I just ignore. I, I, you know, again, non confrontational kind of guy. Well, my wife, she's like, you can see, I can feel it. She's just like, oh. She's, she's saying stuff under her breath. She's starting to get like a little bit worked up, you know, like this guy, I'm going to say something to this guy. Just, yeah, yeah. You know, she starts to maybe say just a little bit and I'm like, stop, you know, shh, what's going to happen? This guy comes back here. I'm going to have to step in, you know, because I'm not just going to go, well, she said it. You know, I, yeah, it was her. I don't know what it was, right? Ultimate fighting championship guy. I'm going to, I don't know, but I'm going to step in front of it, right? I'm going to take the blow, but and, you know, and that's, that's what we're, where we find ourselves. But you know what? The, the, the crazy thing about this, this example, this is exactly what Jesus Christ did for us. We're his bride, right? We're sinners. It says in the Bible that we deserve the wrath of God. God looks down at us and sees this ugly sinner. And Jesus Christ stepped in his path. And he says, no, 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 this is my bride. I got her. And he takes the blow. He took the blow for his bride, for us, paid the price. And that's what the representation of the gospel that he is. This is the ultimate example of a husband and a wife. And what an amazing thing it is to be called his bride and know that he's out there fighting for us. And that he's going to, on that day, when that day comes, that he's going to step in between us and the righteous wrath of God that we deserve. And he's going to take the blow for us. It's an awesome thing. It's the gospel. It's what Jesus does for us, how he loves us, how he protects us. And in the end, he presents us as his bride. We're looking at Revelation 19.7. It's not often that we get to flip to Revelation in the marriage ministry. Revelation 19.7 says this. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. Christ and his bride. The wedding day has, has arrived and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her cl to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. When that day comes, Jesus will present his bride to the Father. And we will be bright and clean. We won't be ugly with the sin in our life and all the dark things and the mistakes and all the things that we've done that has broken our relationship with God. We will be 
clothed in bright and pure linen. It will be like God will see just Jesus. He won't even see that sin anymore. Isn't that, isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome to think it's a picture that that day will come for us. That is what God shows us as his example of marriage, Christ and his bride. This is a time for us to uh, uh, kind of reflect. Uh, Justin is going to come up and um, play a couple songs uh, for us here uh, as we pray. And I just want to take some time tonight. You know, I, we were talking, I just think we don't do this enough here in this ministry. Just take some time and pray. Um, grab your husband or your wife's hand and get, get cozy. Just take a couple minutes, you know, and, and uh, I'm going to open in prayer and I'm just going to kind of leave a few silent spots in there and we'll just kind of pray, pray real slow and just take some time and reflect, you know. Are you, uh, are you the husband God's called you to be? Are, 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 you, are you that kind of husband? You know, are you that kind of wife? Are you that bride? Are you that, you know, how can, maybe there's some things going on right now in your life and your marriage that you want to just bring it before the Lord and just say, hey, you know, God, I, I need to bring this over to you. I, I want to give this up today. I, I've been doing this thing. I just, you know, just in the, in the quietness of your, your mind and your seat, just, let's just spend some time uh, in prayer. And after that, uh, um, just we'll stand up and we'll just uh, we'll worship together. So um, let's take a few minutes here and, uh, and pray. Dear Father, Lord, we, uh, Lord, we are so, so thankful to be given the honor to be called your church, your body, your bride. Lord, we are so thankful that you fight the fights for us, that you step in front of the blows that we deserve. Lord, we're not perfect. We make mistakes. We hurt each other. We hurt ourselves. We sometimes hurt those around us. Please forgive us, God. We don't deserve you, God. We, uh, we don't deserve the honor, but we're thankful. I ask that you bind us together, Lord, uh, as husband, wife. Speak to us daily. Draw us closer, Lord. We don't know it all. We, don't, we haven't got it all figured out, Lord. We, we need you. Draw us in to your word. Draw us into your truth. Draw us to that intimate relationship that you want from us, Lord. Be there in our marriage this week, this month, this year. Father, I ask that you guide us. Pick us up when we fall down, God. Stretch us where we need to grow. Be with us when we don't know what to do. Father, I ask that you strengthen us. I'm so thankful, Lord. Sometimes we reach the end of what we know, what we can handle, what we can take. We reach the end of all that we thought we could handle, all that we thought that we knew. And there you are, God just waiting. Lord, we fall short, we make mistakes, we get angry, we say hurtful things, fall short as leaders, as husbands, fall short as wives, and there you are, God. It's like you promised you'd be. Father, be with us. Guide us and strengthen us every day. Through your Son, Jesus' name, amen.